talk we would do tonight actually is more or less have a conversation um, with me mostly asking questions, but also interjecting, and Scott mostly answering, but also talking back. Because uh, as you would know, I'm, maybe let's do a quick show of hands. How many people have had a chance? This is not, you know. No pressure. Just to know who's read the book or been able to take a look at the book. So we, if we, so we assume that part of what we would need to do to start off is actually really give content to the book. Um, but I do want to sort of make, uh, just remind people before we dive into the content that what Scott does, has done is a history, right? It is an impeccably, heavily archived, and if you're, if you're a librarian who loves the archives, you will swoon over Scott's book. But there is another reason for swooning, which is that if you take seriously that the study of history is the study of the conditions that set the possibility for the present, the history, this book's history of the way in which this thing, the American plan that Scott will describe, sets up the conditions of possibility um, for people who are affected by prostitution laws today. And in addition to that, it examines and sets in place many histories which I, as someone looking at health and law, did not know. The multiple ways in which public health powers were used specifically uh, toward so-called promiscuous women, the multiple ways in which the War Powers Act of two different wars federalized what is essentially a state system, and the, re the residues of all of these different interplays. So part of what you're going to hear from Scott is a really complicated story uh, about the creation of this, of this thing that he describes, the American plan. Part of what you'll hear is a biography or an experience of a single woman. And part of what you're looking at is a map of federal power and state power, public health powers, and the slow constitutionalization of rights, and the absolute neglect of any gender specificity in any of those stories, and the total stigmatization of anything resembled, uh, related to sexuality particularly infections uh, in this context, venereal disease. So that's your background, I think, to sort of, this is, I mean, of the many swooning points about the book. It does the story, but it is also a cross-section of all these histories, and I think that makes it incredibly helpful. So Scott, what is this American plan? Yeah, so first of all, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Professor Nielsen, and thank you all for being here. Um, quite nervous. Uh, <laughs> The Trials of Lee McCall tells two stories, broadly speaking. I guess there's a third, but I never really thought of it in terms of like federalism or, or various types of powers. But I guess I that in is, law now I'm a law school. Now I'm a law school. But the way I've always conceived of it is these two sort of things. One is um, this broad government program that very few people have really ever written about, no one's written about completely, um, which is called the American Plan. Um, I certainly had never heard of the American Plan before, but in broad strokes, um, the American Plan was a US government program under which uh, government agents, federal, state, and local, rounded up uh, tens, probably hundreds of thousands of women uh, detained them, um, examined them uh, for STIs, for very invasive examinations, and if they tested positive for a sexually transmitted infection, syphilis or gonorrhea, they could be imprisoned for months without due process. No trial, no hearing, nothing. Conservatively speaking, historians have said about 30,000 women were incarcerated in various uh, detention facilities during the World War I years, but that has neglected to look at how the American plan remained in force uh, during the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, and in some places into the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, very quickly, the way it worked was um, government agents, usually local but sometimes federal, would walk around and any woman who looked quote unquote reasonably suspicious could be detained, examined, and then if she tested positive, and sometimes even if she didn't, incarcerate her. So I'm gonna stop you right there. At this moment, when, this, when Scott's book begins this history, we're in the 19, in, in World War I, right? In 1916, 1917, the US is about to enter. The state of science, particularly sexual health science, was that, so it was such that there was actually no test for the very diseases that Scott's talking about. So let's back up and when you, this part of what's so grim about the story is the amount of, of invasive practices that went on under it. So what was this reasonable, if you see a woman, she's at the wrong lunch counter, maybe it's a mixed race place, you're suspicious, there's a lot, and this reasonable suspicion, you bring her in, how do you tell you, the doctor, that she has ED? Yeah, it's a really good question. 
I mean, as you say, there were not exact diagnostic methods at the time. There was a rough blood test for syphilis called the Wasserman um, test, no relation to me. Um, and uh, it, it, it was highly imprecise, and if it wasn't done um, uh, perfectly, which usually wasn't because people were in a rush, you could have a false positive rate of up to 25%. That's for syphilis. For gonorrhea, which was about five times as common, um, there was no exact test. There was a visual scrutinization of the genitals, which was highly subjective. Um, sometimes, I mean, people who, who work in public health now will tell you that often the most common symptom for an STI is nothing. So it's really hard to tell. You can take slides of, 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 of various uh, bodily fluids and, and examine them under a microscope, but it was still highly subjective. So this was socially constructing disease based on what people looked like. And practically speaking, reasonable suspicion on the ground could be a woman sitting at a lunch counter alone or with a man. It could be a woman walking down the street alone. It could be a woman walking down the street with a man. It could be, sometimes it was a woman jilting a health officer or a police officer. If she refused to have sex with him, he could threaten to get her head. And, and and that did happen. I mean, there were plenty of examples of that in the archives. So this was an intentionally vague and broad legal standard in order to give local officials as much leeway as possible in controlling women. So the impetus for all of this, the way you tell it in the book, is the, is the, is the war. Why is, the, why is the US's entry into World War I sending troops over to Europe? The impetus for examining women in small towns all over America. Right. There was a fear, somewhat justified, that um, STI, syphilis and gonorrhea, were crippling the US military. They were the most common cause of disability in the military. So the, the largest number of days that soldiers and sailors missed from active service as a result of illness was because of syphilis and, and gonorrhea. The, so you know, as one and a half million young men gathered in military training camps in the summer of 1917, uh, military officials examined them and found to their horror that like one in four or one in five of them had syphilis or gonorrhea. <laughs> so they did a lot of things, one of which was implement the rudiments of sex education. But another one was in, begin to implement this program of rounding up and locking up women who they believed were infecting soldiers, either because of carelessness or because of malevolence. But as I, you know, as I emphasize in the book, that isn't the whole story. Because if it were just about military necessity, the American thing would have ended in 1918 when World War I ended. But instead, it continues for decades. So what I argue was really going on was not military necessity, but rather a response to women getting power. This was a time when women were beginning to get formally educated for the first time. Women were fighting for the, uh, for the right to vote, and the, and the 19th Amendment would pass uh, in 1920. Um, rates of premarital sex were going up. Rates of divorce were going up. So this was quite literally the patriarchy striking back. This was about controlling women who were trying to seize power. So you tell this story, both the kind of moment of World War I and then the kind of capillary action where local authorities realize that they can use the power granted to them. The federal government creates the plan, basically encourages every state legislature to pass the plan, and then all these county health officials hold on to the plan for decades. That's part of the story. The other part of the story is Nina McCall. Right. So who's Nina McCall? How did she become your person? And, the, and, and maybe a little more, maybe a little bit about her story in particular. Yeah. So Nina um, was uh, is a person who's largely been forgotten by history. She was born on a farm in central Michigan in the year 1900. And when she was 18, um, she was walking down the street uh, in like the, the thousand, two thousand person town she lives with uh, her family in, in central Michigan. And the local health officer, uh, or the local deputy sheriff stops her and says, you need to come with me. The health officer wants to see you. Um, it's unclear what exactly he said to her, but uh, he eventually would tell her that the health officer believed she had syphilis or gonorrhea and she had to be tested. Um, she knew the deputy sheriff. She was friends with his daughter. Um, so there may have been personal motives, but that it's hard to tell. Either way, she was taken to the health officer's office, um, uh, examined for STIs against her will, and the health officer very hastily diagnoses her as quote unquote slightly infected with gonorrhea, which medically speaking is, is BS, that, that, that doesn't, can't be slightly infected. 
this, um, she says she couldn't possibly be infected with gonorrhea. She'd never had sex. The health officer says, I didn't say you had sex. I just said you were infected with gonorrhea, which is stunningly inaccurate. Um, she says, I can't have it. He says, you do. Eventually, after they go back and forth, he turns on her and he thunders, young lady, do you mean to call me a liar? Uh, and she shoots back, yes, sir, I do. If you say I'm infected, yes, I do. And you know, it's hard to overstate just how bold a young woman would have had to have been in 1918 to call a male authority figure a liar to his face. Uh, but in spite of this boldness, Nina is coerced into incarcerating herself into a detention hospital for about three months, um, during which time she undergoes um, arsenic and mercury-based treatments, which are very common under the American plan. We now know, and they would realize as early as the 1930s, that these don't cure syphilis or gonorrhea. What they will do is kill you, uh, and in the process, they will hurt a great deal. So how does so Nina get um, basically put into, it's a health detention facility. And part of what's really hard to hold on to as you read the book is that all the detentions that you're describing are in health facilities. Officially, none of these women have been charged. There is no, this is a health detention facility. There is no jail or prison. Part of what's important about the story you tell, although Nina McCall is white, um, all of these facilities are race segregated during this time period. And so the conditions that you're documenting are both are brutal for everyone and specifically horrifically brutal for black women who are the majority of the folks arrested. So Nina, however, is a white woman. She's in Michigan. She gets taken to a health facility where she is encouraged to stay forced to stay. It's like this funny boundary line. Uh, what happens next? And then, I mean, part of what's important about Nina is she not just help, calls this doctor a liar. She goes, she does another thing with her voice. So. Right. Uh, one of the reasons I was, there were a number of reasons I was drawn to Nina's story, but, but one of them is, is, as you say, she really resisted in a number of ways. She was released um, after about three months in January of 1919, and she goes home. Um, first of all, she can't find a job because everyone heard that she'd been in this institution, and because of that, she's so stigmatized that no one will hire her. Uh, and then a government agent comes around and tells her she needs to continue taking injections of mercury on an outpatient basis, which she does for a few weeks, but it hurts a ton. Her hair and her teeth start to fall out, um, and it makes it even harder to get a job. So uh, the first way Nina resists is by uh, getting married to a man she doesn't know, because she thought this would provide her some level of protection. Later, she finds out uh, he, her new husband won't. He wants to prostitute her for his own profit based on the fact that she'd been in this health institution. Um, and Nina can't abide by that, so her next method of resistance is flight. She flees to Detroit, hides out for several months, but then the health officers start threatening her mother. So Nina returns and then resists in another way, which is that she sues the government, demanding that this mistreatment stop. Um, that trial is why we have Nina's voice, because a trial transcript survives, which I sort of stumbled across in the archives of Michigan. And it gives us several dozen pages of Nina's words. And it's pretty remarkable, almost although not quite unique for a woman incarcerated under the American plan, to have this amount of her testimony. And so, you know, Nina's voice survives in this document, mediated as it is by court officials. And, and I found that pretty remarkable. And so she sues and loses, wins. How do you want to describe what happened? So she's suing. She gets three fairly notable attorneys. Yeah, it's interesting. Nina. And a Christian scientist. I mean, there's a really wild, interesting cast of characters who become the funders and the people who make it possible for her to sue the state. And they basically charge the particular doctor with is it Nina? Basically, it's not clear what the exact charge is, but basically a conspiracy to deprive her of her rights. Um, and she, the judge just dismisses the case at the trial level, but then it's appealed to the state Supreme Court, which issues a very complicated ruling, basically saying the law under which Nina was incarcerated is totally fine, totally constitutional, but in this specific case, the health officer had no reasonable suspicion. So therefore, her incarceration is, um, is, 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 in, is not valid. And it gives Nina the right to sue again um, at the trial court level. So it's, it's mixed bag because it, it helps her. Um, and theoretically, if she had pursued uh, the lawsuit again, she could have uh, gotten some money to sue $10,000. 
but in a precedential way, um, it actually ends up hurting future women. Because this case gets cited for the holding that these laws are totally constitutional. And had they had reasonable suspicion, it would have been fine. Right. So maybe a couple more points about, so the laws are found, in Nina's case, constitutional. Every state has some version of these laws. And different states over the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and all the way up through the 60s, right, you find some people still in, at, at detaining women. Although the laws are gender neutral, mm -hmm. uh, the numbers you produce are like radically, like, uh, you know, sort of 10 men and 700 women, right, in different states who are actually detained under these laws. So they're gender specific. And the opposition to these laws is very slow in forming and pretty minimal. Maybe say a word about where, so Nina, individual women resist. But kind of the groups you think might care about it don't? Where's the resistance come from? Yeah. Because the laws are still... Well, the laws are still in the books. Um, none of these laws have ever been overturned or declared unconstitutional by a court. Uh, and they're on the books in every state. Um, yeah, I mean, like, you would have expected certain groups to resist that didn't. And in fact, there were groups that you would have expected to resist these laws that actually endorsed them. These include the League of Women Voters, which was created right about this time, as well as the ACLU, the Nation Magazine, um, the National Federation of Women's Clubs, which represented about three and a half million uh, prominent women. These, they're all endorsing these laws because they believe in this kind of eugenic philosophy that certain women um, are so deviant and misguided that they need to be forcibly returned to conventional morality. Resistance instead comes uh, from a few distinct groups. Uh, one of them is actually Christian scientists, like there were the Christian scientists involved in, in Nina's case, and that's largely because they really hate any kind of government-mandated health care. Uh, another uh, brand of, of opposition comes from um, uh, this sort of small coterie of progressive journalists who see what's happening on the ground. Another strand of resistance comes from certain religious leaders who object to the government sort of involving itself in people's sex lives. Um, there is a large uh, and very prominent group of women who start out enforcing the American plan in the federal government, but later observe what's actually happening, which is far from their kind of utopian vision of how this would help women. They see it's actually hurting women, and so they start to resist and uh, lobby against the perpetuation of the American plan uh, and are totally ignored by the men in charge. But I always find that the most effective resistance comes from the women at the bottom, um, the women who are actually incarcerated like Nina. Uh, Nina chooses to sue. That's a common um, method of resistance for certain women. Um, hundreds, probably thousands of women escape. There are a surprising number of, of um, American plan penal institutions that catch on fire because the inmates are setting them on fire. Um, inmates physically assault their captors. They riot. Um, one, woman, one woman in upstate New York jumped out of moving train to avoid going to an American plan institution. Uh, one woman in Seattle jumped out a window to her death in order to avoid remaining in an American plan institution. So that resistance, which continues throughout every year the American plan exists, I find most powerful and also most neglected. So I know that we're going we're to try to reserve about 15 minutes for questions at the end. But I, I think maybe this is a good time to sort of take us backwards and say, OK, you've got this incredible story, which is both, and you know, in the book, the intertwining of the individual Nina McCall story and the multiple voices of the what you would call you know norms entrepreneurs, right? The various folks who get Rockefeller Foundation was a key player in funding all of this. The creation of the American Society for Social Hygiene and all kinds of doctors basically rest their careers on this. You tell all these intertwined personal stories, political stories. Um, how did you do it? Like, and part of what I think we want to hear about also is, so how did you come to write the book? And then how does one actually find, do all this archival work and pull it all together? Because if that too is an ex the extraordinary, the six year project of, of doing this, I think needs to needs a little bit of pulling out. Yeah, and, and I also think it's important, I always try to talk about the method because I think it's, under, it's important to, so that I can just put my 
methods on the table so that any biases that I have, any assumptions I made, any decisions I made because of certain, because I'm a man, because of any kind of privilege that I have, because I'm contemporary and, and, and these people lived 100 years ago, any, any of those reasons, they all inform the book um, and, and I think need to be understood in that way. Um, I first heard about this in a college course when I was a freshman, it was like the second week of college. A professor mentioned in a pretty offhanded way that in World War I, the government locked prostitutes in concentration camps, that was his phrase. And it was the phrase concentration camp that really struck me because it was like, what? Um, and so I Googled it and there was very little on Google and I looked it up on Wikipedia and there was nothing on Wikipedia. And so I decided to dig into this for the like five to seven page paper I had to do for that college course. And when I was done, I, I, I didn't feel like I really understood this program. I didn't know how long it was or, or how many people were affected or certainly what it looked like from the perspective of the people who were actually incarcerated. So I devoted really to the rest of my college career to finding excuses to write about this. Um, and then, you know, for two and a half years after college, uh, uh, looked at this full time. Practically speaking, the way that I did this was I'm an archive rat. I love archives. Um, they're fun and you get to like, discover stuff. So I, I, I went to about 100 archives all around the country, um, several in other countries, uh, and just looked at collections of, of various kinds of documents to try to get every kind of perspective on this. I looked at the personal correspondence of the men and the women who were running the American plan. I looked at government reports of like agents who were going around and walking down the street and being like, that woman looks suspicious, we should bring her in. Um, I looked at like broader statistical uh, sort of records, like the annual reports of detention facilities or reports of health, which would be like, in the year 1937, we detained 1,000 women. Um, and I, I, I struggled to find the voices of the women who were actually incarcerated, because those are the ones that have been most successfully erased by history. Um, they were not just forgotten, they were, they were deliberately silenced. These women often had their freedom of speech heavily restricted when they were inside institutions. They couldn't write letters, they couldn't really tell their family what was going on. And there was this stigmatization that was so dominant in the culture that like Nina, if they talked about this, they might not get a job. So it was hard to find the voices of these women. I eventually, at the advice of a professor in college, um, what found myself looking through trial transcripts and sort of stumbled on a few people like Nina. There's a few other examples, um, some in newspapers. Um, local newspapers are a tremendous resource, especially since so many are digitized. Um, and so sometimes these women's voices would survive in that way too. But, but that remained the hardest part. And I, I, I was disappointed at the dearth of, of those women's voices, but that's basically the method. And just to remind folks that, and you say this clearly all the way throughout the book, the majority of the women locked up under this plan were mostly black women and to some extent Latina women, depending on the region. Um, there was, at the time, um, the scientific consensus was that the disease affected black bodies and white bodies differently, right? So you have a kind of moment that comes later where the overlap with the Tuskegee trial at the, the unethical uh, uh, syphilis trials of Tuskegee try on, on black male bodies. But the notion that black women were the majority and yet are the most invisible, I think, comes to her clearly in the book. It's a kind of a, a poignant silence. Um, and I think that's a point to also notice that I think um, for all of us who had the pleasure of hearing Kiara Bridges a couple of days ago talk about the way in which identities function in the face of the law, the fact that Nina McCall was white made her more visible to the law and made her trial transcript perhaps. She was in a white town that had local archivists that cared deeply about what happened to white people. So I wanted to flag that. That's not your bias, yeah. but that's the bias that you're working with. And I, know you I mean, I'm sure to that. some extent it is, it is reflective of like the way I prioritize certain types of research. I certainly tried to find the voices of non-white women. As you say, they're harder to find. I mean, Nina was able to get access to these three very prominent lawyers, even though she was not a wealthy person. And I'm sure that's a function of her whiteness. Um, as you say, the American plan disproportionately affected women of color, especially black women. And this is because of the way science constructed different people's bodies. As late as the 40s, the Surgeon General was talking about anatomical differences between white bodies and black bodies that made black people predisposed to have and transmit syphilis and gonorrhea, which is not at all, obviously, a thing um, in reality, um, as we now understand medicine. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, those voices are harder to find, I think, because they would probably have less, less access to a lawyer. Um, 
the communities they were living in were less likely to have these sort of local historical sites that sometimes hung on to documents. A lot of what we know about Nina's life is because of the local historical societies in, in the very small town she lived in. And that's not a reality in, 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 in non-white communities sometimes because of you know, structural racial oppression. And so it's, it's an even more effective kind of erasure, the, the, the erasure of the, of the disproportionately incarcerated non-white, particularly black survivors of the American plan. And also some people who didn't survive, some people died as a result of the mercury or arsenic treatments. I mean, one point to it, it, this notion that when you think about what reasonable suspicion is, right? So this is both a, a coercive health power, which is still, as you said, the plan is still authorized. Um, the Supreme Court decision, Jacobson, right, 1905, which gives police powers for public health purposes, has a kind of statement that at some point it has to be rationally connected to an actual health problem. Um, but the rational connection was dependent on the state of science, which in the state of science, it's a form of subjective knowledge as much as in different moments we insist on its objectivity. And the science that you're talking about, quite from someone who works also in the world of public health, is horrifying. So they're being pushed in detention centers for treatments that don't work and which are themselves debilitating. Just to give people one more kind of in the arc of time, when do effective treatments for syphilis and gonorrhea come into play, and how do they, in your opinion, affect the American plan? The yeah. interplay of science and the law. Yeah, in the late 1930s, um, physicians, uh, researchers developed the first kind of modern antibiotic, which is the salt drugs. Um, which were a huge revelation in, in the late 30s. Um, but then what they were, and they were very effective on gonorrhea, slightly less so on syphilis. The big game changer was penicillin, which um, it, it becomes broadly available in January of 1944, if I remember right. And really, at the end of World War II, becomes broadly available to the public. It, it's, it's impossible to, to overstate what a game changer penicillin was. And I credit it with ending the American plan as much as any other factor, um, although it took many decades. But a single injection of penicillin is usually enough to treat syphilis or gonorrhea. There is no longer any possible scientific rationale for locking someone in an institution for months for repeated rounds of these slow mercury or arsenic-based treatments. And so because they've lost that medical justification, it becomes harder and harder to justify maintaining the American plan in the way it existed in the 10s, 30s, uh, 20s, and 30s. Um, there still is this other justification, though, that like, well, even if we can treat them, we still need to hold them to morally reform uh, these deviant women. That rationale remains salient really into the, into the 60s, and it's only the continued resistance of marginalized women, as well as like the sexual revolution, that really puts the final nail in the coffin in America. So I think what I'd like to do is just to bring people quickly up to the present, um, to say, for example, this notion that we need to arrest women in order to save them. It may have died with the American plan, as the American plan died, but it had not died as a, as a mode of operation. So the Global Health Justice Partnership has, been, has put out these two recent reports about these so-called prostitution diversion programs, and a number of them explicitly state that they are arresting women in order to save them. Right? That is their mandate, that is how they're raising money, and that is the kind of education provided in the different services that the mostly women, again, this is gendered women almost entirely treated under these programs, which are operative in at least 40 states of the United States and having a, a booming business in Connecticut as well, in Hartford. Um, that rationale remains. So I want just to remind people that the kind of, the work that you do in your history to demonstrate the ways in which law and health work together in this paternalistic way to control women claiming health and claiming morality side by side. It has changed guises, but it has not changed its existence. Right? Um, so perhaps, unless you have more comments, I'd like to end with that, to, to open up to questions.